Well, good morning again. I feel compelled to say, he is risen. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Pastor Ernie again for allowing me the opportunity to preach. It is a, there is no greater privilege to me. I'd like to say that he said that any amount of time that I go over one week is credited to the next week. I'm going to try my best, <clears throat> but I did say that I was long-winded last week. Hopefully I won't be this morning. If last week's theme was darkness, and I believe that came through crystal clear, or at least I hope it did, this week's theme is light, resurrection, life, and I hope that comes through crystal clear. I'm going to not read the text because we read it during the call to worship. I'm glad of that, to have it fully in our minds, so let me pray and then we'll get into the message. Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for Jesus Christ. We are thankful for his death. We're thankful for his life that he lived perfectly so that he might die the perfect substitute for our sins. But Father, we're also thankful, perhaps even more thankful, that he has risen because in that is our assurance, in that is our victory. And we thank you for his righteousness. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would draw close to those who are struggling right now. Those who have doubts of their assurance. Those who have doubts of the forgiveness that is available to them in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for those who are going through trials. That they would set their eyes completely on you, the hope that you bring, the hope that you give. It's in Jesus' name, amen. So last week we looked at the cross of Jesus and the physical and spiritual darkness that surrounded his death. And it was a heavy message. It needed to be heavy. It is a heavy subject. And this morning we're celebrating the Easter message of Christ's resurrection. It's heavy as well, but heavy in a different way. It's a different kind of heavy, meaning that it is the absolute bedrock, the absolute bedrock of the Christian faith. It is the single event that validates every core doctrine of Christianity and every promise of God, assuring us that those promises and those doctrines are true. Is the Bible true? Yes, Christ is risen. That validates it. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then everything that was said last week, as well as everything that has ever been said from any pulpit in history about the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation is absurdity. It's not to be followed. Don't believe it if Christ has not been raised. It's foolishness. We're still dead in our sins and there's no hope for you. And that's what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15. That's what he's writing about in 1 Corinthians 15. But if Christ has been raised, totally different deal. If Christ has been raised, then there is absolutely nothing more rational than belief in Jesus Christ. And there is nothing more irrational than unbelief in Jesus Christ. There is nothing more eternally ruinous than rejecting Jesus, and there is nothing that brings more joy to the heart of a Christian than the fact that Jesus is alive. And we're going to see this in Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10, picking up as a kind of continuance from last week. And there are several details in, verse, in these first 10 verses that display the glory of Christ's Resurrection, but I'm just going to focus on the following. The day itself, the angel in the earthquake, fear and faith, and Jesus himself. And so looking at the day itself, the last few verses of chapter 
27 tell us that around three days ago, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting opposite the tomb. Jesus had been buried. The stone had been rolled into place. And I imagine that the thud of that stone as it rolled into place and hit whatever it hits to keep it in place wasn't much different than the sound of the hammer blows to the nails that nailed their Savior to the cross. It had a finality to it that was hard to feel or believe or even for them to hope their way past. Christ is dead. Our Savior is dead. Our hope is buried in this tomb. We don't know how to go on. What do we do now? And they're sitting at the entrance to the tomb with a finality to it that they don't know how to feel, believe, or hope their way past. They had no expectation of what was about to happen three days later, which is where we pick up on this particular morning in chapter 28. And a better morning there has never been in the history of the world than that particular morning for them or for us. But isn't it so often the case with our own trials? We're despondent, we're sad, we're forlorn. What are we going to do? How are we going to get through this? And we can't feel our way through it or hope our way through it. It's so burdening. When the reality for those who are trusting in Jesus Christ is that in short time, our mourning will be turned into joy. And not just any joy, but a joy that makes our trials not even worthy to be compared. But even so, we tend to not be able to see beyond the moment, the hardness of the moment, the darkness of the moment. We struggle with possessing a strong hope that is confident in the eternal weight of glory that our hard moments are producing in us. And they are producing good in us. They are given to us for a purpose, a good purpose. What the two Marys were feeling this morning was no different. Verse 1 begins matter-of-factly and uneventfully. It reads, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now there are some beautiful actions that are taking place here. Even if just the ordinariness of the day and the tasks the women were hoping to perform, just in those things. They could barely wait for the time to pass when it would be acceptable to go finish preparing the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior. The lateness of the day when Joseph placed the body in the tomb, as well as Jewish law, prevented Jesus' body from being properly taken care, taken care of and prepared. And so, here were these women, up before dawn, caring for their Lord. Now, there is hardly anything. And I tried to think of something. I couldn't say 100% because there might be something that makes me want to get up before dawn. But I couldn't think of anything. There isn't anything that makes me want to get up before dawn. And if I do, you can be sure that it's a near 100% duty-bound obligation. I don't believe that that was the case with these two women. It was a far richer emotion than just duty. They were with him at the cross when his disciples were not. They were now attending to him in his death at the tomb where his disciples are not. There is tender devotion in these women. In their actions is a picture of love. Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon observes this, out of Mary Magdalene, Christ had cast seven devils, and now she asks, or acts as if into her he had sent seven angels. She had received so much grace that she was full of love to her Lord. This was no duty-bound act. This was no duty-bound devotion. It was a devotion of love. And the question is, have you or I received less grace than her that would excuse a heart that attends to Christ so coldly at times? Because we do. Our hearts are often cold. The promise is, though, that even in our coldness, he will hold us fast. And that is beautiful. Jesus stated that those who have been forgiven little, love little. There isn't any one of us who hasn't been 
forgiven much, but we just too often think far too little of our sin and then act accordingly with a coldness of heart or a hardness of heart. The actions of these two Marys seemed routine and uneventful, but this was no ordinary dawn. This was no ordinary morning. This was the dawn of death's defeat, which sealed the reversal of sin's curse for those who believe and have faith in their Savior, Jesus Christ. God's holy law requires perfect obedience to obtain perfect righteousness. Let me repeat that. God's holy law, the law by which we must live, the law by which we must be found righteous, God's holy law requires perfect obedience to obtain perfect righteousness. We can't do that. We can't do that for even a moment. And so there must be a perfect sacrifice in our place. This can only be God himself because he alone is perfect. God had to die for us so that God could give us God's righteousness in our place. That is what we have in Jesus Christ, the perfect substitute, the perfect sacrifice, God's perfect righteousness. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And in Romans, Paul asks a question. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is there to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Paul is explaining here that there is no more justice required because it is God who does the justifying and it is Christ whom he has justified us through. And then Paul puts an exclamation point on God's acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice and his justice being satisfied by saying even more than his death. As great as that was, even more than that. He was raised and is at the right hand of God, interceding for those who have been and are being justified. Now, why does he say this? Because as he explains in his letter to the Corinthians, if Christ is not raised, then his death really doesn't matter. If Christ isn't raised and he's dead, so what? You have no obligation to follow anything. You have no obligation to do anything. All this stuff that we do Sunday after st Sunday is pointless if Christ is not raised. We are not justified. Preaching is useless and faith is in vain. But as Christ has been raised, then you do well to pay attention to the preaching of Christ because it means something. And faith in him matters eternally. Paul continues in this section to say that if Christ has not been raised, then our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. And so the resurrection of Christ assures us that our faith is not a misplaced faith. It's not a misinformed hope. Even more, it assures us that for those who trust in Jesus, the resurrected Savior, the one who has defeated death, the one who is risen, for those who who trust in him, we are not any longer in our sins. And we need to hear that. We need to hear that often. For those of you who are trusting in Jesus Christ and believe him to be the risen Savior, you are not any longer in your sins. Christ has paid for those. And you have been justified through his righteousness. And that is a good message to hear because some of you struggle, even I struggle with the guilt and burden and pain of past sin. You find it hard to believe, even impossible perhaps to believe that you are really and fully, finally forgiven. The resurrection of Jesus is the assurance that Christ's 
sacrificial death was accepted as the full and final payment for every one of those sins. Every single one of them. If there is any remaining cost for sin that went unsatisfied, if there is a point in time when God looks upon somebody's sin and said, oh, hold on now, we didn't cover this one, he would not have been raised. He would not be alive. The tomb would not be empty because he would not have been the perfect sacrifice for the sins of his people. But Christ is risen. And that is the glory and power of the resurrection. It is the capstone of the gospel. It is the greatest event in history. It's the greatest event in eternity. And as such, it is heralded in power, which is the second main heading that shows the glory of the resurrection, the earthquake and the angel. In verses two through four, it reads, and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Now, when Matthew says, behold, he's saying, listen up, you need to hear this. This is important. And it always precedes something significant. In the resurrection of Jesus is heralded in triumph the same way that his death made the earth convulse. As an earthquake shook the earth in shock at his death, so it shakes the earth in triumphant celebration at his resurrection. Listen to what one commentator states. An earthquake was a royal trumpet to proclaim this victory, the greatest that ever was obtained against an enemy. The deep murmur and hollow sound which came from beneath the earth gave notice at one blast to heaven and hell and to all Judea that the Son of God, about that instant, as I do verily believe, did break the gates of brass and smite the bars of death in sunder. That is awesome. I love it. It gets me charged up. I want to read it again, but it's too long. <clears throat> What magnitude this earthquake was on earth, I don't know, but the magnitude it had in eternity was beyond enormous. I imagine that it rocked and shook and roared in heaven and hell far greater than it did on earth. It was a loud boom on earth, but I imagine it was a, it was a boom of infinite magnitude in heaven and hell. Think about it. All, everything, every bit that man and hell could do and all that God had to do in his justice is answered with an angel of God sitting on top of a rolled away stone. I mean, it's a little bit comical when you think about it. You have to wonder what the angel was thinking. I mean, it's so unfair and lopsided. Like going off to war with cap guns. It's an instance where we see God, the God of heaven laughing at the schemes of man. Psalm 2 Verse 4 reads, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And in this verse, the nations are raging against God. The peoples are plotting. The kings and the rulers of the earth have all gathered and are counseling together to come against the Lord and the Lord's chosen one. What utter foolishness this is. What stupidity this is. But it's exactly what we see here in the text. From the raging of nations against the Lord and the plottings of man against him, all the powers of hell, of hell to the emptiness of the tomb and an angel sitting on top of the rolled away stone. The people did everything they could to put Jesus in the grave and then to keep him there. And it was all in vain. The God in heaven laughs. Three times the security of the tomb is mentioned in chapter 27. Joseph had rolled a stone in place, according to verse 60. In verse 65, a Roman guard is tasked to keep the tomb secure. And then in verse 66, a seal is put on it, on the tomb. And some of your Bibles will reference Daniel and the lion's den that, that Daniel was put in. And the meaning is that anyone who breaks that seal is in violation of law, of authority. And it's punishable by death. It's a treasonous offense. This was a supermax tomb. 
I mean, there was no getting in and there was no getting out is what they were aiming at. And these weren't mall cops. I mean, these were seasoned soldiers, soldiers trained. But here's an angel sitting on top of all that plotting and scheming and security. The guards quaking in their boots, the seal of the kingdom ignored, the stone rolled away and the tomb empty. I can ima imagine that the angel's thinking as he's sitting on the very representation of all the might and power and authority of the kingdom, all the might of hell and man against the Lord. I can imagine the, the angel is sitting there saying, is that all you got? Is that it? I, I mean, if you got more, bring it. I've got, I've got time. The angel is triumphantly sitting on the stone and Jesus is triumphantly seated at the right hand of the Father, having finished the work of his high priestly office of perfecting for all time those who draw near to him in faith. He has sat down. What victorious and triumphant glory at Christ's resurrection. It was a powerful and fearful moment and that moves us into the third main aspect of the glory of the resurrection, the fear and the faith that was present. And we see it in verses four through eight. But before looking at verses four through eight, John says in verse John, first John four eighteen, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. And I believe that's what we're seeing here at least in part. And it would be worth looking at more in depth, but let's just look at the contrast between fear and faith, between the soldiers and the women. The soldiers are the very picture of might, the very representation of authority, the very essence of intimidation. They were war machines, powerful, armed and dangerous, battle-hardened and brave, courageous, seasoned, merciless. They are duty-bound to death to the emperor and to Rome. And what's interesting here is that the word used to describe the trembling within these guys is sao. And it's a variant of the word used to describe the violent quaking of the earthquake that shook the ground just a few moments ago, seismos, which is the word that gives us seismic. These battle hardened war machines became like dead men, the lifeblood seemingly drained out of them. This was fear, earthquake type fear, cowering fear. So great was the glory of God in just an angel from heaven at the pronouncement of Christ's resurrection that the lifeblood drained out of their bodies. Well, not literally, they were pale. <laughs> I love it. Contrast this with the women dainty little things. The exact opposite of the soldiers. You know, sugar and spice and everything nice. Now, ladies, don't get upset with me because I'm only trying to make a point here. But they are the ones who should have had the lack of emotional composure to where they would swoon and faint and quake. And of course, that's that's me saying this, who can't even read scripture without having a moment. Yet, they don't. They don't quake. They don't swoon. Whatever the timeline is when the women arrive, the text tells us that the soldiers are quaking with fear at the presence of the angel. Anytime, every time an angel of the Lord is present, it strikes fear in the heart of whoever is there. But the angel says to the women, the dainty little things, do not be afraid. What a blessed command that is. What a beautiful sound in the ears and hearts of the redeemed. Do not be afraid. That which causes the wicked to faint from fear is nothing to fear for those who are made righteous in the Son of God, who are perfected in his love. Because that love, his perfect love in you, casts out fear. Do not be afraid is the message that Jesus says to you. Notice that the angel doesn't tell the guards not to fear. He doesn't even really give them a second glance. But they need to be afraid. They need to be quaking in their boots. They need to have an earthquake happening inside their souls. 
the unbeliever has every reason to fear. Every reason to fear. The only ones who have the ability to live in peace and without fear in this world are the ones who, having nothing at all to condemn them, have nothing to fear when they finally face God. And that is only accomplished by and through the righteousness of the resurrected, not dead Jesus Christ. Words of warning are needed here. The fear that the soldiers experienced at the presence of the angel is nothing compared to the fear that will strike the hearts of those who have rejected Jesus Christ when he comes again to judge the world. It is nothing compared to that fear. Spurgeon again states, what terror will strike the ungodly when all the hosts of angels shall descend and surround the throne of the reigning Christ on the last great day. Are you trusting in the only one who can save you from the terror and the wrath of that great and awful day? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ and his righteousness to be the only one who allows you to stand in the face of God when judgment comes upon you? I pray that you are. That is the glory the hope and the promise of the resurrection. In Christ, you are raised with him in newness of life and you're given his righteousness that saves you from the wrath of God. And when he comes or when you go to him, whatever that day may be, you are able to not be afraid. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said, is what we read in the text. And it's what the angel tells the women. And we see the patience and long-suffering of God, not just in dealing with our callousness of heart, but the thickness of our head. The angel doesn't browbeat them. He simply and gently reminds them that this is what Jesus has said. Why are you here? Why are you looking for him? He's risen. Just as he said. What? Why are you here? He told you he wasn't going to be here. <laughs> but he doesn't do that. I would do that. He simply and gently reminds them that this is what Jesus had said, that he would not remain in the tomb. How quickly we can forget, right? How easily we can allow our hard circumstances to crowd out the truth of God's word and his promises to us. Hard times come. The first thing that gets ejected out of our brain and our heart is the promise of God to be with us. His peace working through us. His goodness working all things together for our good, even in those impossibly hard times. The angel shows the women the empty tomb and then tells them to go and tell the disciples what they've seen and that he'll meet them in Galilee. There's nothing left at the tomb. Don't linger here is basically what he tells them. There's nothing here left for you to see. Don't linger here. Go, tell. Matthew records that they ran with fear and great joy. What a sight that must have been. Joy triumphing over fear. They had experienced something that caused fear in the heart, but an even greater joy, a joy that can't be compared to the sorrow that they had a few days before or even that morning when they came to the tomb. That joy had completely erased all of that despondency, all of that sadness, all of that feeling of what are we going to do now? They knew exactly what they were going to do now and they were doing it, they were running. What glory that is. They came to the tomb to perform the final preparations for a dead man, but they saw an angel of God, an empty tomb, and the sure word that the Savior whom they loved is risen and is going to meet them. Man, what must have been going through their minds? And what a sight that was. These two women running with overwhelming and overflowing joy. And it's all because of the final aspect of the glory of the resurrection, Jesus himself. Why were they running? Jesus had risen. And they were told by an angel that they were gonna meet him face to face. I'd be running too. I can't run much anymore. And it's, it's, a, it's a hilarious thing to watch me try to run now but I would be running. <laughs> he, 
He is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. He is all the glory in the heart of, of, of a Christian because his life is the glory and the security and the promise of our salvation. Look at verses 9 and 10. It's the second time that Matthew says, pay attention to this. It's important. Behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. What an understatement, right? Hi. <laughs> And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers. Man, that is so powerful. My brothers, go and tell those ones who had deserted me. Go and tell Peter, the one who had denied me three times. Go and tell my brothers. He did not disown those who disowned him. He still calls them his brothers. That's so rich. Tell them to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, there's a lot to see in these two verses, but let's just look at three things real quickly. First, they met him. Second, they take the two women, they take hold of him in worship. And third, they're told to not be afraid. If all these two women had was the angel telling them that they would see him, but then never do, then all we'd have is a lying angel, a fibbing angel, and a missing Messiah. But that's not what we have. Jesus met these women face to face, along with hundreds, if not thousands more. And then they take hold of him. Jesus is no mere apparition. It's not just spirit. It's not imagination. They take hold of him and worship him. He is Christ in the flesh, raised from the dead. And they don't just take hold of him, they worship him, and he doesn't stop them. Now, that's important. That's an important detail, because if it, if it had just been an angel, the angel would have said, don't do that. I'm not the one you should worship. Jesus doesn't stop them at all. Yes, worship the risen Savior. And that's because he is God, God the Son, God the risen Son, and he is worthy of all worship and praise. And finally, they're told not to be afraid. Now, I'm not sure what this fear would have been other than not being able to fully grasp what their eyes were seeing and their arms were holding and what their hearts were worshiping. I mean, how do you, how do you process something like that? But it is a phrase that means so much more with Christ as our resurrected Savior. Do not be afraid. If he is not risen, then there is much to fear. Even as good and faithful, moral people, oh yeah, so and so, he's a good person. So what? If Christ has not re risen, then there is much to fear, even for those who do good all the days of their lives. If Christ is not their savior, that there is much to fear for those who do good all the days of their lives, who are moral and well-meaning, who are charitable and beneficent. So what? If Christ has not saved you, if Christ is not your righteousness, then you will have to deal with the wrath of God against your sin, as good as all of us may judge it to be. We are not your judge. You may be great compared to me. You may do far more than me. Most of you in this room do far more than me. But I have Christ in my heart. And when God looks at me, he sees his son, Jesus Christ. And it covers my lack of whatever it is that you do better than me. If I don't have Jesus in my heart, if he is not my righteousness, then I better be quaking in my boots. There better be earthquake fear in my heart because there's going to be a time when I face the God of justice with the only thing I have to give is my sin that I wanted to cling for myself and say, I don't need your savior. I don't need your resurrected son. I'll take whatever it is that you want to give me whatever punishment it is, and I'll just hope for the best. That is a fool's hope. 
Now, where is my place? If all we do is love and worship a dead Savior, then he is no Savior at all. And we still face the wrath of God at worst and an unknown eternity at best. But that's not the case. As a Christian, we can hear Jesus say, don't be afraid. I am your righteousness. I have overcome your sins. I have overcome hell's fury. And I have satisfied God's justice. I, <clears throat> I have secured your peace. Because he is risen, we also shall be raised. 1 Corinthians 6, 14 says, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you will be raised to life. Because he lives, we also shall live. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 18 through 19, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also shall live. What a promise that is. What security that is. What peace that gives. And how that dispels any fear that the Christian might have. Fear is gone. Judgment is satisfied. We have peace with God. Christ is risen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We would have no hope without him. We thank you that before the foundations of the world, you had a plan to save sinners. And save them you do. Finally, fully, completely. And we are thankful for that. Father, help us this day to think more about Jesus so that we might love him more, devote ourselves more to him, worship him more truly. For his sake, and in his name we pray, amen.